Yep, once again, the sky looks like Florida. I mean, you could just picture being on the beach in Key West or maybe even Havana, looking up and seeing this scene. And guess what? We take a look at the trajectory models and the air is coming from those areas. These are the parcels at 500 meters in red, 1,000 in blue, and 1,500 in green, which represents a lot of the clouds and lower atmosphere that we're seeing. So it's not coming from the Caribbean, but it is coming from the tropical Atlantic for sure. A look at the polar orbiter satellites does show that the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Atlantic looks pretty clear of dust. And also it looks like it's fairly clear of storm systems, although this is a little disturbed area coming together over the Havana, Cuba area. And further back, way out in the deep Atlantic, looks like another little wave coming together. Because we're getting into that season where we have to keep an eye on the tropics. Now, one other way we can look at dust is to go into this menu here. This is the NASA Worldview site. And what we want to do is add in a layer. And we want to go to this aerosol optical depth. And we'll go ahead and turn that on. And that gives us an idea how congested the air is with dust. Not too bad out close to the North America, but out in Africa, Looks like there's a little bit of disturbed air in that region. So maybe down the line in about a week or two, we may see more of that heading this way. We'll just have to see. A look at NHC does show that that wave out in the deep Atlantic has closed off and has formed up into a tropical storm. So we have Gonzalo, 45 knots. So it's really pulled together. Which way is it heading? Well, there you go. That does have some potential to reach the US. So they do have that developing into a hurricane before it reaches the Windward Islands. And then it looks like an unfavorable environment out in the Caribbean. However, it is going to be tracking towards the Gulf of Mexico. So we'll be watching that next week very closely. But the odds are that these, a lot of these storms tend to head into the Yucatan and into Mexico and die out there. But there is a chance they'll head up into the Gulf itself. The upper level patterns, this is the 200 millibar chart, the top of the troposphere at about 39,000 feet. Now what we see is a progressive flow that's developed across the U.S. We've gotten rid a lot of a lot of those blocks that we had across North America and the Hudson Bay vortex looks like that's weakened into the type of pattern we usually see this time of year. Just a couple of vortices, one right there and one up north of Yukon. So the jet stream running across the Aleutians onto the coast near Vancouver and out into the Great Lakes region and across the Maritimes. Now you can see that the strongest segment of the jet is across the Maritimes. So we know that the strongest frontal system is going to be out ahead of that somewhere or maybe along it. I'd probably, well, there's no troughing with this jet max. Some might be inclined to think maybe a wave kind of like that and possibly another one out ahead of that. Can't really tell. Um, after all, there is a lot of warm air advection into this region out near Greenland. But anyway, that's out of the picture. What we're focused on mostly this time of year in the U.S. is the subtropical ridge. And we find it down here. It's very hard to tell just by the heights and we don't really want to use this. What we want to do is zoom in on the U.S. and bring up the actual wind flow. So let's do that. Okay, so now there's the wind flow. We can definitely pick out where the subtropical ridge is. So it looks like part of the Bermuda High is built into the Carolinas. The ridge axis about right there. And then we move eastward. And we see that the winds are kind of indeterminate across Texas. And it evolves into kind of a high over southern Colorado right in that region. Let me get rid of that little cursor readout. Okay, so high across Colorado, a ridge onto the east coast, and then it looks like kind of a pressure weakness in Texas. So let's, you know, it's kind of hard to see it looking at this, but let's break this up by looking at the actual streamlines. So I'm going to draw this out. And this is where really where it helps to use your 
classic textbook streamline analysis technique. If we do that, we can find a deformation zone across Oklahoma. Okay, so I adjusted that just a little bit, but there's the flow right there. Down to the south, there's the deep tropical flow, mostly down in south Texas, and the deformation zone centered across Seymour, Texas, and then it looks like maybe a kind of a wave going through the Big Bend area. Another wave heading east up in Missouri. And if we look upstream, looks like another wave in Florida. So that'll be the next feature making its way towards Texas. So you can definitely use some of those tropical techniques this time of year in the United States. And also looks like a cutoff low in California. We need to kind of keep that in mind. Maybe a little bit of a weak jet rotating around the base of that low there. But the main prevailing westerly is way up there along the U.S.-Canada border. Now, looking at this small-scale picture, we do see a smaller jet max right there in the Great Lakes. That's probably associated with a small frontal system in that region. I would expect to find the fronts somewhat like that, so we'll look for that on the surface analysis. It may not be exactly like that, but uh, should be somewhat in that ballpark there. There's the conditions across the southwestern U.S. this afternoon. I was really surprised to see a lot of that tropical air making it into New Mexico. Look at those 60s all the way through Roswell and even all the way to El Paso where we've got a 59 degree dew point. So obviously that's tropical air that has infiltrated the high plains and into the southern Rockies. Now I'm not too sure about bringing a dry line into Arizona or New Mexico. That doesn't really fit the textbook profile there, but I felt compelled to at least, you know, put something there. I will say it does look like the gradient of the moisture does kind of wash out through that area. So I'm not really too sure you could put any boundary in there. So it's probably a good idea to kind of trail that off into the New Mexico area. But yeah, that's a good sign that the moisture is in Arizona, 60 degree dew point there at Phoenix. So we are in monsoon season, even 64 there around the, I think that's Lake Havasu City. In Texas proper, dew points have come up into the mid-70s in a lot of areas. Moisture axis, that's going to be probably in Louisiana, maybe the Mississippi River Delta, maybe through there. And that's going to be just deep tropical air. We don't have any upper level flow we saw in the 200 millibar chart. It was pretty much dead in the upper troposphere. So this is definitely an air mass thunderstorm regime. There's what we're seeing on the radar at this hour. Let's back that up about 24 hours. So this goes back to yesterday. We had a little complex of storms around the Altus area. And that eventually fizzled out around sunset. A lot of overnight monsoon storms in Arizona and New Mexico. Those gradually died out. And then we had this other little MCS up there around the North Platte area. That died out pretty early. By dawn, it was pretty much gone. And then we're just kind of left with a little bit of elevated stuff around uh, Guthrie early in the morning, and then the air mass stuff really gets going in East Texas and Arkansas. So that's the convective picture for this afternoon and kind of fits in very well with what we see on the surface analysis. And there's the visible satellite picture at the hour. The remains of that MCS in Nebraska looks like a little MCV there, almost like a little mini hurricane in the mid-levels. Winds aren't going to be that strong, but uh, it does look pretty interesting there. Plenty of moisture in Texas. Can't really pick out the dry line. We know it's probably into New Mexico, and then it kind of fizzles out. We Not much of a moisture gradient in that region. And I would expect probably these storms to go up. Maybe some convection in the Phoenix Channel or area. I can't really look at things with that level of granularity, but I think there is a possibility of maybe something rolling off the mountains there into the deserts. The northern or northwestern U.S. looking pretty quiet at this hour. Looks like the marine layer is covering much of Portland and Seattle. Very nice across the 
northern states there, but looks like the monsoon moisture is spreading into Idaho. Pretty quiet in the Dakotas, a little bit of elevated activity just east of Pierre. And there's that little vortex there in the Grand Island area. Surface map showing a cold front rolling out of Alberta. And I think we've got a triple point there east of Calgary. Plenty of moisture up there in Saskatchewan. And I might even be looking at maybe a chase day in Saskatchewan. That's a possibility. Just, just looking at the surface patterns. I don't know what the scooties are going to be showing at this hour. But uh, that does look uh, certainly interesting. You can see that back flow up there near Saskatoon. And the dry line just kind of snaking its way into the Black Hills and down into Nebraska. And return flow into the Dakotas area. And then we go eastward and we get into that polar high across Minnesota. And just in, in case anything does get going in Saskatchewan, this to me looks like a very dry environment. So I think maybe the moisture depth is on the low side. Because, you know, we, if we had sufficient moisture, we should be seeing a stratocumulus field of some kind and maybe some boundaries, but nothing like that. We could still get storms, but I would expect them to trend more towards the high base type. And just thinking ahead to tomorrow, as things shift eastward and we bring more moisture up through the Dakotas, I'm thinking a possibility of stronger storms maybe in eastern Saskatchewan or Manitoba. In the northeastern U.S., a front just like we expected in Michigan there. Looks like the center of the low is actually right around this region right here. I would probably fix the analysis and bring the fronts kind of like that. Very warm in Detroit and down into Ohio and Indiana. If it's uncapped, there may be some storms through that region. And then we've got this very weak stationary front there in Quebec. Kind of a stagnant, warm air mass out in Pennsylvania and New York. And there's our satellite there. Now, this is the kind of stratocumulus field I wanted to see in Saskatchewan. Obviously, there's plenty of moisture depth there. So we could see some storms going up there this afternoon as things warm up. And plenty of high cloud coming across New York and Pennsylvania. That's probably dynamic lift. Uh, maybe a combination of that. Maybe some anvils. No, we didn't have much anvil activity. I, I guess I guess that's probably dynamic lift. Uh, the cloud field along the jet axis. And we'll take a look at the southeast. Very typical of midsummer. Can use those cloud streets to kind of figure out where the low level wind field is. Now, this here, this could be either northerly flow or it could be southwesterly flow. Now, I was seeing this little low pressure area in Mississippi, and I think that's bad data. See how with the values are 1, 1019, 1018, 1017, all the way around, and it's showing 1014. Nothing like that in the area, so I went and did a QC. That's one of the things you can do in digital atmosphere there. You can fix bad data. So let's look through here and see what the problem is. So I'm looking at this field right here for the values coming out of there as I scroll through different stations. See those are all about 1017 to 1019 in Mississippi. And then I hit this one here that's 998. So that's some bad data there. That's from NJW. We can go to Aviation Weather Center and see what's causing that. We'll pull up the reports there. And that's Meridian Range, Mississippi, probably a Navy station. And 998 millibars. 998 looks like they've got some bad data and you can see automated station so that's probably your typical military contract equipment something wrong with that so we need to start getting rid of that now in digital atmosphere you can actually set rules for individual stations so I'm going to fix that so we don't ever see that again Put 
put in KNJW. We'll delete the sea level pressure whenever we come across that. And it's done. So we'll go ahead and delete that for now. And we'll replot the map, reanalyze the pressure, and we're going to say that low will be gone. And there we go. Not much going on there. In the southeastern U.S., there's a little branch of the Bermuda High, little ridge coming into South Carolina there. And indeed, that wind flow is rounding the side of that ridge. And that's what we're seeing there with the cloud streets. All right, so storms definitely underway there in Texas, where the ridge is a little, the ridge aloft is a little bit weaker. Heights are a little bit higher in the southeastern U.S., so we're not getting much storm activity due to the subsidence and the warm air aloft. And for our astronomy section, Comet Neowise is still out there. It is going to be at its closest approach tomorrow, Thursday. And there's what the sky will look like around 9.30 to 10 p.m. your time. We do see that the moon is starting to rise. It's going to be kind of a crescent, very low on the horizon. And as we go forward with each progressive day, the moon is going to be higher in the sky. It's going to cause more illumination, and it's going to interfere more and more with the comet. So you want to try to see the comet while you can. You will need a clear sky and no light pollution because it is a little bit dim. But once your eyes adjust, it is a pretty spectacular sight. And as we mentioned yesterday, in the evening sky to the southeast, you'll have Jupiter on the right and Saturn on the left. And if you have a very dark sky, maybe you'll see the Milky Way. The Sacramento Mountains, where are they? Well, this mountain range is located in southern New Mexico and it divides Alamogordo and the White Sands Range from Roswell. And it's a pretty high mountain range and it's kind of an extension of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains that we learned about last week. And this is kind of an important mountain range because it forms a barrier whenever, whenever we have that, those cold air masses sweeping southwestward during the winter time, those form a barrier and keep the air mass from getting into the inner mountain ranges around El Paso and the Rio Grande Valley. And as we follow the mountain range south, we get into the Guadalupe Mountains. And that includes, of course, Guadalupe Peak. And a little further to the south, the Davis Mountains, where we have an observatory. You wouldn't think that there would be a major astronomical facility in Texas, but indeed there is. And that's the one there. It's run by University of Texas. And we were actually going to go to an astronomy night there many years ago. I want to say around 2002, but we didn't quite make that due to other obligations. Anyway, that does it for our Wednesday edition of Meteorology Lab. Hope you enjoyed the show. We did run over the 15 minutes that we talked about yesterday, but when there's stuff to talk about, we'll go ahead and do that. Otherwise, I think about 10 to 15 minutes will be our normal range. Anyway, hope you have a great rest of the week, and we will talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.
Wendy's, the McDonald's. Do you think I got enough Big Macs and stuff? Yeah, that's been a while.